Welcome to the Real Estate Masters Podcast, where we interview the top names in the real estate game. If you want to grow your real estate business, see more podcasts, or get free resources, go to www.remcommunity.com, the only podcast that allows you to directly connect with the guests in many of the highest level names in the real estate game. You are in for a treat with our next guest. Do me a favor, subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review, and don't forget to go to remcommunity.com to connect with some of the highest level real estate professionals in the United States through our community and through our high level masterminds. Let's go. All right. Welcome to today's show. We have an awesome guest as usual, uh, Mark Holsey. He is a REMAX agent. Um, he's got a ton of awards. If you're watching the video, you can see behind him, he's got a ton of accolades and uh, been in the business a long time. Uh, has raised five kids, I think he's he said, and um, does a lot of high level stuff in the commercial real estate world, uh, mainly on the brokerage side, but also investment as well. So um, as you guys know, I just love interviewing successful people. Doesn't matter if it's residential, real estate, commercial, sales or investing. Uh, we're just going to have some high level conversations on um, how Mark has scaled his business up and how you guys could potentially get into commercial investing. So Mark, welcome to the show. I appreciate you coming on. Tony, I love being here. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, let's get our conversation going. I'm, I'm anxious to talk with you. All right. Sounds good. Well, I love, I love talking about people's stories. Um, everybody has a different story, right? About how they got in the business and maybe some struggles, some things you learned throughout the way. So we'll just kind of start there. Tell people how you got started and, and how you got to where you are now. Yeah. So kind of the quick story would be uh, in Chicago in 1983. So a crazy long time ago, probably well before your time, um, I got licensed in real estate in Chicago. And so I knew I was a real estate guy from very, very, very early on. But then I spent a lot of years kind of in the marketing, advertising and business development world. And so to kind of cut to the chase, I'm a hybrid. I'm a hybrid between a marketing business development guy and a real estate guy and uh, knew that I had a lot of, uh, I had a passion for investing uh, for many, many years, but like many people kind of sat on the sidelines, sat on my hands and didn't do much with it. And then after spending about, oh, eight years or so in Chicago, eight years in Michigan, working in uh, marketing and business development and media, uh, I moved my young family at that time back to Minnesota and became an investor and uh, built a portfolio of about 50 units, uh, primarily small residential, multifamily, duplex, triplexes, fourplexes, some mixed use properties. And then and, and did that essentially up to a full-time position uh, as I was kind of transferring my time from a, being a retained marketing consultant into an investor. And, uh, and then ultimately got recruited to go into real estate sales because I was moving so much real estate myself. And at that time, I was a little bit apprehensive about actually um, putting the suit and tie on to represent clients, but I started doing that instead of representing businesses and guiding them with their marketing and business development. And, um, and it's done very well. Um, I've really enjoyed <clears throat> taking a, a lot of real estate knowledge and I've converted a lot of investing knowledge into the brokerage side. So that's really what I've done. I've parlayed lots of lessons, many hard lessons and difficult lessons. So it didn't always certainly come easy by any means. And, and then uh, turn that into representing clients. And so we've represented hundreds or thousands of clients over the years, and we've just done a huge amount of business. And we worked with from the very beginning investor to the most sophisticated investors, many of whom uh, we work with today on things like commercial investment, net lease investments. But um, we've covered the gamut and I've covered the gamut. I love brokerage, but I also love helping people build portfolios. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit of the story, but more, most importantly, yeah, raise five kids. Two of my kids work with me in the business. So I'm super proud of that. Um, I've got Hayden Sawyer working my business. Um, Hayden is a CCIM. That's certainly one of the very best designations in all of commercial real estate. So we're a CCIM shop. Um, that's for sure. Big time. And Sawyer also works with me, but we run a small boutique firm here in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and we do some work nationally as well with some net lease buyer clients. Fantastic. Fantastic. So tell us, um, uh, you talked about residential before we started here and, and you talked about 50 units. I'm not sure if they were residential or not, but tell us um, kind of the transition or the difference between residential and commercial in your mind, um, because there are some people wanting to go from residential to commercial or some people that just want to jump directly into commercial. So if you could touch on that a little bit, and then also, you know, the difference between the sales side and the investing side. Because for me, when I started uh, in this business 20 years ago, 
I started as an investor, got my license as an, ag as an agent, did both for a little bit, a little while just to kind of get going. And then once I could just do investing on my own, um, then I, then I took off and just did investing from there. So I guess start with the, uh, residential to commercial aspect. If people are wanting to jump from residential to commercial, uh, any, any advice you can give them and kind of the main differences between the two. Yeah. So, so, and I speak a lot to this, even on our YouTube channel, uh, results in real estate results, commercial, you can look it up, but I, I talk a lot about this. Um, and, and I talk about both sides. So I talk a lot about the, the investing side of things. And I talk about the brokerage side and, and going from a residential investor with your houses or your small multifamily or mixed use buildings, apartment buildings, and then giving consideration to other types of commercial investment assets, office, retail, industrial, maybe even land. And then of course, the same thing on the sales side, on the brokerage side of things, um, what it takes to basically play in our space or swim with the sharks. Um, this is a dog eat dog business when it gets into commercial investment brokerage. Um, it's not for the faint of heart. It's not something you just jump into. It's definitely something that you need to grow into. I love brokerage. Um, many people are involved in real estate sales, leasing, um, but they've got their sights set only on investing. Um, and I believe in investing because it's obviously one of the very best ways of creating wealth in America around the world, period. Um, but I also was the one who built up from, you know, a single unit to 10 units to 20 units to 50 units. And, and I ran around like a crazy person with a young family and that was all good and well. And I learned, like I said earlier, I learned a lot of lessons about how to build a portfolio and how not to build a portfolio and some of the, the key things that you don't want to do. Um, but actually I'm, I'm a marketing salesperson. And so being given the opportunity to represent clients and sell and lease commercial investment real estate, um, I love it. I mean, I don't know that I love it every day, but I, I really love it. I'm passionate about it. And probably most importantly is, is the, the opportunity is, is huge. I can't really kind of get away from that. So um, building the portfolio is great from a wealth building perspective. And certainly from a cash flow perspective, it's pretty good. Um, at the same time, when I can compare what we do from a brokerage point of view for creating income and creating wealth off that income, it's extraordinarily substantial. So um, I, I'm maybe the opposite of many people that, you know, start off in the sales and they just want to be an investor. I was more the investor and I got more into the brokerage side of things. And the brokerage side of things has served us really, really well. It's again, I've, I've raised a family and, and, you know, it's paid for lots of, you know, tuitions and all kinds of things. So it's done really, really well for us. And uh, of course, I didn't have to deal with quite as many tenants, toilets and trash, but instead I shifted my energy over to uh, client service. Um, the difference is huge. So I'm not going to minimize the difference. Um, I think that anyone that thinks they can quickly, whether it be in, as an investor and give consideration to say you're having your, your single family homes or your apartments and you want to give thought to starting to invest in retail or office or industrial or net lease investments. So we love net lease investments and those are triple net investments. Um, they're kind of the ultimate of all investments. As far as I'm concerned, there's nothing better than net lease investments, but it takes a tremendous amount of capital. Those are the Starbucks coffees, the Walgreens. Okay. So that's what a net lease investment is. And we do, a, we do a good amount of that work and we enjoy it. Even within the commercial brokerage world, Tony, it's very different. It's one thing to sell a, uh, you know, a $2 million office building or a retail small strip center versus uh, transacting or brokering a net lease investment. It's a different world. And so it doesn't make any difference what side of the fence you're on, be it investing or brokerage. And you start looking at the differences between residential and commercial, and there's very many of them. Um, and like I said, it's hard to articulate all of them at this time. But you know, uh, I mean, the key thing for, you know, for anyone who's an investor, once you start to understand the numbers, right, when you understand the numbers, that's going to be the key to everything. The difference is on our commercial side of things, we're based very much on, on, on key pieces like uh, certainly, you know, cap rate, discount to cash flow. Yeah, we care about cash on cash returns, um, whereas the smaller investor might be looking at, you know, cash flow per year unit per property. They might be looking at debt service coverage ratio. All those things are important too, but some of the vernacular and some of the underlying underwriting, of course, is a little bit different as we look at each of these different categories. So 2021, if we had this conversation a year ago, early 2020, you may have had a different uh, answer to this, but someone wanting to get into commercial real estate right now, they've never done a deal before. 
what would you, how would you recommend they start? Like what would the steps be? And then what type of commercial investment would you uh, push them towards? Multifamily, warehouse, give us a little bit of a, a scenario on that, on how people can get started a little bit easier and faster um, on, on potentially how they could do that. I don't know that there's an easy or fast way to get involved in commercial investment brokerage. So I don't know that those words work real well within our industry. It's a capital heavy investment. So if you're undercapitalized, you probably don't belong in commercial uh, investment world. It takes capital. That's why so many people will pull their money together. Or of course, we work within syndications and partnerships to start to pool money together to potentially buy some real estate. But it's just kind of like, it's, it's really not any different than the residential sense of saying, well, let me start small and let me work my way up, right? So you certainly can do that. And so you don't need to jump into the biggest office building or retail building. M many people naturally um, should gravitate to that which they know. Uh, that's just a logical thing. Everybody understands that in commercial real estate, typically you're not going to find an industrial investor who owns one to 10 million square feet of industrial space also balanced out with this multifamily portfolio. It's a very specialized business and most people absolutely stay in their land. Lane. Um, industrial investors stick with industrial product, office people, retail people, and surely multifamily people. And we also recommend and suggest that that's a good idea. Now, the sophisticated investor, can they start crossing over into some of the other product categories? Of course they can, but each of these is very different. An office tenant and the office tenant requirements is going to be different than the retail tenant and certainly dramatically different than an industrial tenant. Somebody who's worked within single family homes or small residential multifamily, I call that two, three, four units, or small apartment buildings, less than 10 units each, you know, they should stay probably within the residential space. But sometimes what happens, Tony, as you know, is that they can get really kind of tired of dealing with tenants. And so typically they'll move over and have a, a property management company start working with them. And that's fine, but not always is that the answer. And then sometimes they say, I want to get into commercial commercial investment work because I want five-year tenants. I want to have a retail strip center where I can put in a good national credit tenant and I can have them taking care of more of the you know, property expenses and property improvements. And I want to get a little bit more hands-off like a net lease investment. And so that's a good opportunity to do a 1031 and start to really study the various product categories Maybe consider even going out and working on your CCIM just as an investor, not even as a broker, but working on your CCIM. I can't, I can't recommend that enough. Um, I think that's critical to start really understanding the fundamentals of investment analysis because that's what we do. We are investment analysis experts and we can dissect this information. We can understand the risks. Uh, we have great measurements that we can put to every single income producing asset so that we can know where are we today and where are we going with this asset. And so I think that it's, a, it's an education component and then a team building component. So you want to put the, it's just like anything else, right? You got to have the very best people, the very best team around you, whether it be the tax attorneys, uh, the real property attorneys, uh, the commercial real estate brokers, people who are playing in this space every day. So I hope that kind of answers that question. Yeah, lots to touch on there. So I, I think you started touching on something I was going to transition to, and that's that it's that no matter what you get into, you really have to have good people on your side, right? Like when I got into the business 20 years ago, um, I compare the first 10 years to the second 10 years. First 10 years, I didn't have very good people on my side. I was just throwing people in and didn't have mentors, didn't have coaches, didn't have, I was just trying to figure it all, my, all, all myself. And that's that's just how I've done things all my life, I feel like. And then the last 10 years, this, this, or the next 10 years, which has been the last 10 years, uh, I've stepped my game up with hiring really good people, with having really good mentors, coaches, mastermind groups, and things of that nature. So I think probably really what it comes down to is probably finding someone that has done what you want to do, pick their brain, get, them, get some mentorship, uh, figure out who your team is, right? You mentioned the team. And then stay in your lane. I think that's a good one. It's like, you know, pick something. You may have to look at a few different things before you pick it, but like stay in your lane, learn something really well, stay there, laser focus on it. And then as you become successful in one thing, then maybe you could take on getting into potentially another uh, type of investment. 
So let's get into sales and marketing. So you said sales and marketing. I love sales and marketing. I mean, if you think about it, any business is really sales and marketing, right? It doesn't matter what it is. Absolutely. Um, That's right. So let's talk some high level stuff there. So what, you know, you've been very successful in commercial real estate. I can tell you're a very educated, polished guy, right? So that obviously helps. Um, <laughs> but you also have to have, you know, marketing sales. You have to have, you know, a bunch of other things to it. So tell us what you've done uh, on the marketing side to help yourself stand out from the competition and, and be, uh, be as successful as you've been. Well, thank you for that, Tony. I appreciate, I, I appreciate some of the, the, the underlying compliments there big time. Thank you so much for that. Um, so I have a career in marketing. And so as a commercial investment broker, our group results commercial today, we're very much on the listing side. So we're on the seller side of things. Our focus is very much taking product to market. And the reason I mentioned that is because taking product to market is very much a function of marketing. We are packaging and positioning assets and taking it to market. We also do it because I like to be in control of the listing. If I'm in control of the listing, I'm in control of the transaction. Um, we work with buyers. We're extraordinarily selective when we work with buyers. And that just becomes once you work in brokerage for many years, you start to realize you start to realize the nuances, what works and what doesn't work. And our time is so extraordinarily valuable that we need to make sure that we're focusing on money making tasks. And so, but I also, because we're marketing experts, that means we know how to take the office building, the industrial building, the net lease asset, and how do we package it up? I'm a belief, big believer in, in maximum exposure, okay? So, so my job is to get the most money for my sellers as we take these products to market. So I'm not a, let me sign a listing agreement, call up a couple people and say, hey, I got this great, pro, this great office building for you. We're not that. Um, once in a while, sure, we put together off-market deals, but many times we are the people that take this to CoStar and LoopNet and to our local boards uh, we put together very elaborate uh, offering memorandums and videos and drones, and we take it to the market and we shop that product. We maximize the equity for our clients. I've been the person, I've been the seller many, many times over, like you have, Tony. So you know what it means to squeeze everything we can out of that asset, right? We've, we've put so much money into the asset to be a strong income producing asset. And now it is time to exit. It's time to, to move our monies into another place. We want to get everything we can out of that. So I've got no problem with off-market deals. Off-market deals are fine and they've got their place, but then there's a place for folks like us that know how to do the marketing and know how to do the positioning and, and work that product in the market. So my many years of working in, in strategy, marketing, marketing cons consulting, and, and all of that it serves us really, really well for what we do today. And so... Um, but I, you're right, because it doesn't matter what the business is. If you're kind of missing that marketing piece of it, you're going to have a hard time being very, very successful because marketing is just fundamental today to making any business work. So I think that we have a huge advantage with that automatically. We're able, that allows us to stay as a very small focused investment boutique, because I'm not interested in having 80, 90, or 100 agents. I work within a very large brokerage. The brokerage that our commercial investment group is, is a 1200 agent firm. We're a very large firm, but I happen to run a very small firm within a very big firm. And I dig that. I like that. It allows us to be very picky and selective about the work we do and the people we work with. And once you're a mature business, you're kind of given that luxury to start saying yes to you and no over there. And so, but marketing has allowed us to do that. So I hope that, you know, speaks to the marketing piece a little bit. Yeah, I think I think um, residential real estate is probably a little bit different than commercial real estate from a, a standpoint of residential. You can get a lot with with relationships, but I imagine commercial real estate is even greater than that because you're dealing with astute clients. You know, astute clients hang out with other astute astute people, and so <clears throat> so you know, creating those relationships and really doing a good job for them. I mean, you could have a two, three, four, $5 million listing, do a really good job for them. And then someone refer you a $10 million client, right? I mean, it's just one of those things that you may not have to market really that well. I imagine at this point, you've been in the business long enough where marketing for deals probably isn't as important to you as really catering to the client, doing a good job and then getting referrals. Would you agree with that? To me, they're both equally important. So I really wouldn't dismiss the latter for the former. 
Okay, but never do we let the former start to start to let the latter weigh itself out. So in other words, yes, those relationships are critical. The relationships I have with my fellow commercial brokers who are very successful as we transact together becomes very important. So yes, as you're moving up the ranks, you know who are the producers, who has the product, who knows how to put the deals together. Because if you're if you're a residential person, you're trying to play in my space, you're going to have a hard time and actually Commercial brokers are not the easiest people to deal with. So that, that's a big one right there. That's why you want to make sure you've got the right people on your side. Uh, if you can't talk the talk and walk the walk, we're pretty much going to not want to deal with those people so much. But so when it comes to marketing, quite honestly, if I'm taking a $400,000 uh, $400, building to market or if I'm taking a $4 million building to market, we actually put an equal amount of, well, I got to be careful there. Yes, yeah, sometimes the $4 million or, or $10 million building is going to take some extra marketing horsepower and dollars. But quite honestly, the amount of work by the time you package it up, you put the offering memorandum together, you put your rent rolls, your financials, there's a lot of information that goes into a commercial investment property. So I, I consider, but then again, we're kind of, you know, we're kind of picky best practices people. We, we kind of make sure that everything is in good order um, and, and try not to miss a beat on any of it. So it's all of it. It's your reputation is everything. So reputation is it hands down, as you know. I mean, reputation, we live and die by it. Uh, we're in Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota, and Minneapolis, St. Paul is a vibrant market. It's a smart market, but it's about a number 14 market, and it's a small market. So yeah, we've got 3M and Target stores and General Mills, uh, and we've got some you know failing football teams and not so good baseball teams here as well. Um, but we're, we're a, a highly educated and, and very strong corporate environment. We've got a lot of good, smart brokers here. And, and I'll tell you what, the moment you, the moment you screw up, right? The moment you don't treat somebody right is the moment that uh, you're going to start feeling the pains within your business. So, and, and you know how that is. I mean, you know, there's nothing better than having those relationships with lenders, with brokers, with lawyers, and obviously with all of our investment clients. Absolutely. A great team can make your life really easy or much easier, I should say. So let's get into um, kind of kind of the past and lessons you've learned. So I always like to know kind of what some lessons you've learned. You know, a lot of people, when they think of successful people, they think they have it all together, right? I mean, you know, it's in some capacity we do, right? But then it's like, there's stuff behind the scenes that happens, you know, whether it's, you know, business almost fails or, you know, cash flow issues or whatever it is. There's always stuff that happens throughout a career. So tell us about, I don't know, one or two things that you really learned um, in the past that, you know, maybe were tough things for you that ended up being, you know, potentially good that um, you could share with the audience. Yeah, no, in fact, you know it, Tony. I mean, it's the best learn the best lessons are the toughest lessons, right? I mean, that's that's where we really get our growth. We get our growth, and that's why they're called growing pains, because many times you, you got to go through some pain to get to the other side, and then you can really bang zoom. And yeah, I went through all of mine. You know, I can sit here now at this stage in this age of a career and sound like I know a lot, and you know, hopefully I do after all of these years and hundreds or thousands of transactions. Actions, I, I better right at this stage of the game. So there's nothing special about that. Um, oh, I've got some really great lessons that I've learned and some really hard lessons that I've learned. And I'll go to the investor side, the investor side more than the brokerage side for sure, because I had been in other businesses before I was recruited in to now represent clients. And so I had been an investor, I had bought dozens and dozens of properties. And so I knew transactions very well from doing them. And so then it just came down to, uh, and I take fiduciary very, very seriously. So fiduciary just means when I represent a client, just like a lawyer represents a client, um, we're not happy hazard about that there you know my license is worth literally millions of dollars and so we don't jeopardize our license in any way shape or form so we follow all that closely but let's get back to the important stuff and that's your question that's the lessons um i was able to grow a portfolio during the days when just about anybody could grow a portfolio okay you didn't need to be very smart you didn't need to be very special because money was free flowing money was everywhere and i was part of that so i was part of that you know ability to go out and get money 
get money easily, get money too easily. So this was certainly obviously um, pre-Great Recession. So it was within those years. I started investing in 96 and was pretty aggressive from 96, probably all the way through 2008, somewhere in that range. I still hold investments today, but I shrunk my portfolio dramatically, um, partially willingly, partially not so willingly, because I went through the Great, Great Recession and, got, and went through lots of good pain. Lessons, the lessons are simple. Okay, the lessons are super simple. You heard me talk before about, I made the point that commercial investment real estate, you better have capital. You better have money. Because if you think you're coming in here and you're going to go become the next billionaire on just your, your smile and a handshake, no, you need to have capital. You have to have that money. And so I was able to work and build a portfolio that was fantastically over leveraged. All right. I mean, you know, I took leverage to the moon and back and of course did ultimately over leverage catch up with you or did I not follow some fundamental principles of managed growth? Did I grow too quickly with too much leverage? And the answer is, yeah, I did. I absolutely did. And so that meant that I was ultimately undercapitalized. And when you're undercapitalized, not only can you not grow, but you can't sustain in the event. Okay, it just so happened that the event that I was lucky enough to experience was the Great Recession. So we got to experience a dramatic decrease in values that almost happened overnight. Um, I mean, it happened rapidly. It happened, I'm talking a matter of six or nine months where you could suddenly say that individual little property over there just lost thirty dollars or $40,000 worth of value that now put me into a negative position. And now I'm upside down. So even though I might be able to service my debt, the, the, my spreadsheet, the value just took a big plummet. And if you don't have the capital to be able to sustain through that, you've got some serious issues. So I was fortunate enough to be able to dispose of a lot of properties rapidly. And I came out just fine through all of it. But I absolutely tell investors a couple key things couple of really important things, Tony, and especially today, because I, you know, our YouTube channel does a lot of educating of investors and brokers. And it drives me crazy when I see some of the other people in the marketplace trying to make real estate investing sound too easy and too simple. And everyone should do it. I don't think everyone should do it. I don't think this is designed for everyone. Everybody. This is a business and it needs to be treated as such. And not everyone's going to jump into real estate investing um, with very little capital and suddenly become the next, you know, Elon Musk. No, but that's not the point. The point is knowing how to use real estate, this collateralized asset, and start to let appreciation, depreci depreciation, OPM, other people's money, right? The tenants over time, paying this down to truly create a passive income stream. And you don't need to be gigantically huge with this huge portfolio to do it. And so that was something that I learned as well. And I really talk a lot about it today. And I'll say to people, I've found some crazy successful investors who have had six or nine houses. That's it. Nothing more. A half dozen houses. They've paid them down. They're paid off. They've created a wonderful income stream. And everyone always thinks, yeah, but I need to turn those six houses into 60 houses and then 60 houses into those huge, gigantic shopping malls over there. And they've got all these like super duper grandiose ideas. That's not me. I'm not a believer in that at all. Now, if you want to go there, I more power to you. Okay, so I'm not going to stop anybody from going after their dreams of building the biggest portfolio in the whole wide world. But I'm a lifestyle guy. So I'm a lifestyle guy. I'm about raising a family and having a nice relationship and going to the lake and having a great business. And so I want to make sure the balance is there. And sometimes people can get too focused on your ego can sometimes run away with you. So your ego can run away with you with this gigantic portfolio and suddenly like I'm worth more because I have all these properties. And I say, let's just slow down a little bit and let's make sure that this investment strategy fits your lifestyle strategy. Let's design a life where the real estate investments are going to work very well for you in the short term, midterm and long term. And then you can be successful. So I hope that's a long, sorry, long-winded answer. But yeah, I made some pretty good mistakes. And so now I'm more about proper leverage, proper growth, keeping your goals in line with your life. So fantastic. Now, there's a couple of things I want to touch on. I took a couple of notes here of, of things that you touched on that I kind of want to reiterate as we wrap up here. 
Uh, but you did mention Elon Musk. So we talked about lessons. I mean, think about this. Elon Musk at this point is, is the richest man in the world, right? And it just happened literally in the last, I don't know what it's been, last three months or something like that. But, you know, something that's been publicized lately is that he almost went bankrupt, what, a year, two years ago, whatever, you know, whenever that was, like right. recently. Um, so he went from potentially bankrupt to the richest man in the world. Now, obviously, that's extreme. Uh, but the point is, is that we go through things, we, uh, you know, we hit rock bottom in certain, in, in certain instances, we get over leveraged on properties. I've been there before and had to sell off a bunch of properties to make up for other properties. Uh, I've been there. So we're going to have lessons, right? So if anybody's down in the dumps right now, it's not something that's going to stay forever. There's always going to be a lesson to it. And then the other side is, side is, is that, you know, looking at your, uh, your bio, if anybody looked at that, they would be like, man, this guy is just wanting to be the biggest and baddest, you know, commercial real estate, you know, person uh, out there. But, but talking to you, you're very balanced. I mean, you have five kids, you obviously, you know, you've done something right there. It's not easy to raise five kids. I just had my first couple of years ago. Um, and uh, I downsized my business a couple of years ago. I had 15 employees and I downsized to three, three employees. And I, I couldn't be happier with that one business that just is very lean, makes just almost as much money as the 15 employee business that I had. And now it allows me to concentrate on, you know, the other businesses that I've started over the, over the last several years. Um, and, and, and I feel more, way more balanced. So I think those are some two two good, two good things is, you know, there's always something good and the bad, and you don't always have to be the biggest and baddest to be successful. Right. Yes. So awesome. Well, it's it's well, a matter of how do we measure our success, right? So I think that's really what it comes down to, or how do you measure wealth, right? And so each of us have our own, our own way of measuring it. And I think, you know, our culture wants to measure it with the Lamborghini or the private jet, or maybe your bank account or whatever else. And for me, it's just, you know, at this stage of my life, it's not how I measure wealth. Um, I get to work with two of my kids here in this business, and I'm lucky to have five adult kids now. The two are last two are in college and married for, I don't know, almost 35 years uh, to a fantastic partner who has been through all of it with me. That's all of my wealth. Um, and I'll take all that wealth over everything else in the whole wide world. So those are kind of some lessons from a middle-aged guy that, you know, yes, I love, I'm a, I'm a doer and I love, you know, it's great knocking out, you know, great production every year. And it's nice having a portfolio and all that stuff. But I think that we really got to keep our eye on the real prize. And so that's what I try to do. And I'm, and, you know, congratulations to you and your, your, what do you want? Two-year-old? Is that right, Tony? Getting ready to turn two here in a couple months. Yeah. All right. Well, that, that's, that's as good as it gets to me. That's, that's the, the richest part of life is right there. So there's not a property or, or a cap rate in the whole wide world that can touch what that two-year-old brings to our lives. So I, I hope you're just sucking up every minute of oh, that. Yeah. So yeah, it's going fast. It's going fast. But uh, no, I appreciate you, Mark. Uh, great guy. Um, and you have a results in real estate uh, YouTube channel, correct? Is there anywhere else you'd like for people to, to go learn more about you? And- yeah. And, and, and thank you for that, Tony. But quite honestly, you know, we, we just started doing our YouTube channel results in real estate because I want to take so many years, decades of real estate experience and start sharing it. Okay. I'm not selling anybody anything today. Um, resultscommercial.com, our website, resultscommercial.com is a great place to go to because videos are on there. They're going to send you over to our YouTube channel, but anyone who's interested in investing, I think that you're going to find, I've loaded up a lot of content on there and we're, you know, tomorrow we'll shoot eight more videos. Um, we'll have a hundred videos on our YouTube channel here by June 1st. Um, it's kind of a balance between both investing videos and then working within the commercial brokerage, commercial investment brokerage world. And so whether you bounce to resultscommercial.com or find us you know, on YouTube on results in real estate, um, I think some of your audience might, especially for the the newer or intermediate investor um, or somebody who wants to you know, work within commercial investment real estate, there's some good information on there for everybody. All right. Good stuff. Well, congrats, Mark, on all the success in surviving five kids and 35 years of marriage. (laughs) That's not an easy feat uh, being successful in all those things. So I appreciate you, Mark, and look forward to connecting with you again soon. Oh, Tony, thank you for this. It's wonderful to meet you and uh, keep up your good work with your young family. And I can't wait to talk to you again.
Thanks. I appreciate you. All right. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Now go to www.remcommunity.com to connect with today's guest, see our high-level masterminds, and to get free resources. Don't forget to share this with a friend and leave us a five-star review. We'll see you on the next episode.